We're in business to save the planet, and we use making clothes to do that. The cure for depression is action. Every one of us has to step up and do what you can according to what your resources are. That was the voice of Patagonia's Yvonne Chouinard. I'm Matt Barr, you're listening to Type 2, a podcast from Looking Sideways in association with Patagonia that explores the intersection between outdoors, action sports and activism. You probably know by now, but in each show I've been meeting people who are using their passion and involvement with the cultures we all love to create change. We've been discussing the issues they're engaged with, the change they're seeking to create, the difficulties involved and the rewards that follow. You can find each episode of Type 2 on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, yeah, I'm on YouTube, SoundCloud, all your podcast platforms. So whichever platform you listen on, make sure you hit subscribe so you can get each episode as it's released. All right, this week's guest is Lucy Siegel, a writer, journalist, broadcaster and filmmaker who's been one of the UK's foremost voices on issues of nature and climate for almost two decades now. Today, she co-hosts the So Hot Right Now podcast, is a trustee for Surface Against Sewage, is chair of the Real Circularity Coalition, and is still a hugely prolific journalist and broadcaster on the subject. As you might imagine from that CV, this breadth of experience has given Lucy a unique perspective on some favourite Type 2 themes, which is exactly what we talked about for this episode of the show. We caught up in early November 2020. It was that mid post election period where we didn't know who'd won so we had a little chat about that but this is generally a really fascinating conversation that took in the psychology of change when it comes to climate action the best way of communicating your values in an increasingly polarized world the importance of that u.s presidential election is it really the century's pivotal climate related event and why fast fashion which is a topic of particular interest to, to Lucy, is emblematic of the wider challenges we face. And of course, as usual, we discuss Lucy's own inspiring path, which in many ways mirrors the paradigm of the wider climate conversation. There's a lot to take in here. It's a wide range in chat that sees Lucy laser in on detail and zoom out to provide priceless panoramic context to the current state of play. There's also some timeless advice on personal activism from one of the wisest heads in the game. Big thanks, Lucy. Really enjoyed this conversation. Hope you all do too. Enjoy the episode. So, how are you? I'm actually really good. I think um, I always slightly worry about winter and then when it happens, it's not that bad. So... It's it's kind of a really beautiful day here. I live We've on got the, the lockdown. River. Got the lockdown weather again. It's come back. We're on day one of lockdown, and it's it's like the spring again, isn't it? You know that beautiful weather that we had. It is, isn't it? It's like uh, nature is like a real extrovert, and every time you know that people are going to be at home, it just pulls out this sort of show stopping display. Uh, in our house, so my um, husband works for Evelina Children's Hospital, which is part of St Thomas's. So we don't observe lockdown because he has to go up to work every morning and our life, I'm always hanging around anyway, so uh, in a very unstructured way. So our life sort of continues as usual, which is really odd. But what I do notice is loads more people come to this area and um, I, I look across the river here and there's a park behind with a golf course which is shut. Um, and there's just like loads of space and there's loads of nice birds in there and it's really nice to see people coming here and enjoying it. So we're also talking on uh, the two days after the election now, isn't it, in America? Well, they're still counting the votes. Um, yeah, I, d I don't want to particularly go too deep into that, but I'm interested in in your take on how significant it is for this whole um environmental conversation i'm going to say inverting the commas just to put it that way because i was a guest on a podcast recently and i you know probably using a bit of hyperbole said it was the most significant political event of the century so far and probably had the potential to shape the conversation for the rest of the century 
and the get the, the the host was a bit like come on you put you're putting on a bit thick there aren't you and then i thought about it and i thought i don't know if i am actually i kind of feel like it it is that significant would you would you kind of feel that way as well do you think it's yes i think you're on the money with that observation i really do i think it's we're running out of electoral cycles in which to make pivotal changes and i think that one of the really super awkward moments which i really enjoyed on fox news on election night was um when the voter polls started appearing next to the presenters faces and there was a number of issues but uh, one of them was climate. So I think it was like 72% were somewhat concerned and very concerned about climate change. And that obviously runs counter to a lot, a lot, but not all of Fox News's output, which is broadly um, climate change denying in, in its outlook. So, um, you know, this is a voter poll on, on uh, Fox News for the American public and for the first time really displaying in front of a huge audience that the climate change is a significant issue then the next poll comes up and it's um not as high like something like 56 percent of viewers of voters wanted more investment in renewable energy like this is appearing on the screen on fox news and it's like okay gosh and then the next day of course um the us formally pulls out of the Paris Climate Agreement. So those two things is really obvious. They are at odds. So even if some of those voters voted Trump, which statistically I think they would have done, they are still saying that climate change is important and acting on climate change is important, and yet Trump has pulled them out of the Paris Climate Agreement. You then have Biden um, tweeting maybe 12 hours later saying uh, in 77 days, we will rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement when I'm president. So, you know, that's a remarkable shift in public discourse. If you can tune out a lot of the other stuff that's happening, not to minimise that, but it's, you know, um, incredibly um, frightening and important. But that is a really big shift. And we should be able to draw some conclusions from that. I think also I did pre-election, I work with Ellie Golding, the singer, a lot, and we do a lot of um, uh, social media stuff uh, where we focus on climate and nature. And one of the things we're both really interested in alongside her team is working out how to communicate good climate messaging in a way that impacts and a way that helps her audience, which is pretty huge. And she did an Instagram Live with Al Gore, which I was involved in a week ago, so a week before the election. And Al Gore was really saying, you know, that Biden's, uh, the Biden-Harris uh, clean energy plan is incredibly strong. It's like one of the strongest we've ever seen. And, you know, we went and had a look at it and it is really kind of impressive. So if and when Biden is elected, um, president, well, what, what will he be, 46? 46th President of the United States, we can expect that there will be a big agenda on climate, including renewable energy, but also we've had other conversations in some of the other work I do around uh, circular economy with, you know, people who inform Team Biden. So we know that um, sustainable, the sustainable economy is going to be a linchpin of a Biden administration. Now, obviously, there's all sorts of other complications about how much power and how much change they can actually bring to bear. But the conversation is shifting along with uh, the administration. So that's going to be a very powerful force. And then if you're very optimistic, as I tend to be <laughs> quite optimistic, is, you know, you've got China that's come out with its uh, net zero goals by 2060, with a peak in emissions by 2030. You've got strong um, European legislation. OK, we think in the UK, um, not that we're in Europe, obviously, I mean, as a landmass, um, <laughs> which you can't really deny. Even come on, even Brexiteers can't deny that we are part of the European landmass. But uh, but geographically, but um, you could say look, net zero is too far away. And I think there's a very, very good argument for bringing it, um, for being much more ambitious about it. But nevertheless, for it to be enshrined in law is important. So what all these big economies adding up to, if Biden is elected and then rejoins Paris, you're basically on course for a net zero world um, by 2050. 
And that's incredible. So someone put it to me this way. If Justin Bieber should tour for as long as Bob Dylan, he will be touring. And you may think this is a bad thing. He will be touring in a net zero world. <laughs> so I would say to Justin Bieber, I hope you're planning for a net zero world. So that is, yeah, I mean, that is a significant sum because obviously if, if, if Trump is elected and we don't know the answer to that yet, then the world's going to take a different path. So you're... Um, you, you mentioned... Well, I don't know. I mean, well, uh, you know, if Trump is um, is elected, um, I mean, I think it's looking unlikely at this moment, personally. But um, it, it, it is also the shift in that discourse and the shift in the markets is going to make it increasingly difficult to be an outlier. Like the evidence, it's not the evidence because he, he obviously won't listen to evidence, but there is a significant shift happening in the markets, I believe. Um, and it becomes really like futile to hold out against those kind of pressures. How do you characterize that shift then in the markets that you're describing? Like what does that actually look like? Well, I mean, it looks like hundreds of millions of dollars of investment going a different way. Well, billions actually. And and in the co the context that you're talking about this shift, the changes that you feel there is in a, a genuine political and general appetite for that now that's that's well, it's not political. Changed. The political appetite, in some ways, is neither here nor there. If you think, if you if you um, observe the power of the markets, I mean, you know, you need to talk to asset managers who are setting up funds left, right, and centre, not just for renewable energy, but now a circular economy. You see the share prices of. Um, uh, organizations and businesses that um, are doing what you are broadly following sustainable criteria you know that, that those those assets and that market is just really really hot and that's coming from somewhere like that's that's way beyond the sort of do-gooder um, metric you know I mean when fair the virtue, trade the virtue signaling uh... <laughs> yeah there's no that's not vir these people don't virtue signal they don't give a yeah. crap about virtue signaling they are really like up for making loads of money <laughs> and I think once those markets start to shift but they do they are very good at analyzing risk by and large which is what obviously a lot of this is based on and you know max if you look at circular economy maximizing resource um uh value is like a really core cool principle of business, but it's kind of got lost in translation because we have such a linear um, outlook. So the whole kind of take, make and dispose or take, make and waste um, framework that pretty much governs everything we do. Well, if you start to, if that starts to be constricted by the environmental realities, which is true, and you start to move into the, what, what Bill McKibben described in that famous Rolling Stone piece that he wrote as the carbon bubble, and he described oil and gas assets as stranded assets, you can start to apply that to some consumer goods and services. And that makes a very compelling case for shifting out of those and into um, stuff that is more circular, for example. And that's what some of these funds are starting to do. So, you know, people are, I mean, honestly, I don't know anything about asset management, but people who do are telling me that that is where the focus is and that is where the energy is. Um, yeah, I mean, in the old days, if you think about fair trade and when fair trade started, um, you know, people would kind of write it off. There was one sort of famous detractor who wrote off uh, fair trade in the UK as being biscuits for vicars. <laughs> So that was the only market. <laughs> this has moved. This has all moved way beyond biscuits for vicars. Now you've got some of the most rapacious um, uh, financial systems in the world taking it very, very seriously. I'm not saying they're great, by the way. I'm just saying that's the no, of course, of, it. of course. Well, it's a shift, isn't it, that you're describing? Because, like you say, if it's market led, then at some point it becomes inexorable because that's. That's how our system works, essentially. Yeah, if you're in a market-led you know. system. And even someone who's as much of a crap businessman as Donald Trump, you know, he's got to, he's, he's, he's going to have to understand that that is where the markets are leaving, are leading, rather. I mean, it was interesting also during the election campaign, um, there was a bit of a debate around Texas, wasn't there? And he, you know, did a few rallies where he was talking about 
you know, Biden wants to get rid of all your oil and coal jobs. Um, and he really, you know, he taunted Biden in one of the debates about the Green Deal and stuff like that. And, you know, what was sort of missed out, obviously, deliberately, from a Republican argument was the fact that um, wind energy and wind power is now one of the biggest employers in Texas, in the state of Texas. So, you know, once you start having a real discussion and a real conversation um, along non-partisan lines, the realities are very much in the favour of those who want to act on climate. So you... You know, obviously, you've been active in this area for for a while now, and can you can you date this shift, like can, to to when you've started seeing this kind of, um, I'm just going to say momentum shift, like to as you're describing, like how recent is that? How recent do you do you see that change being? I think the underlying principles are all, are much older. I think there are sure. I think there's lots of different shifts lots of different times it's really interesting actually it's a really interesting question it's very interesting to think of it in that way so if you think of something like planetary boundary science is really and that's sort of understanding the resources that we have and a safe operating space for the for the earth and and um so really if you're thinking properly everything that you make or produce should conform to planetary boundaries so be in that safe operating space because yeah. that's where the the science, the numbers tell us what it is. And that's really sort of 30 years of earth science that's kind of aggregated by very clever people in Stockholm, as, as so much of this science is. <laughs> um, so I would say that's 30 years bubbling up. And then maybe 2015, well, it sort of really informed the Paris Agreement. So that's very important. There's no doubt in my mind that a lot of this stuff was crystallised by the Paris Agreement and you know some people say in terms of green finance i don't know why i'm talking about finance so much because it's really not an interest of mine at all but um uh people have, have said that paris uh, treaty is the birth certificate for green finance and then i would also say within that there are particular cultural moments and moments in the taxonomy like the language of expressing or crystallizing these points. And I would say that the Bill McKibben article for Rolling Stone, which I mentioned, I can't remember when that was, maybe 2012, when he was talking about the carbon bubble and stranded assets. I think that was like a massive moment. I think it's one of the most read uh, climate articles ever or something like that. But that was like a massive breakthrough. And then, of course, you know, a small Swedish girl uh, probably delivered the most critical cultural breakthrough moment and i mean that's the kind of amazing powerful thing about the environmental movement is you never know quite where it's going to come from (laughs) and um, it's not like dead dead white male politics where you know you have to be over 70 and it's rancorous and all the rest of it which is donald trump is both unpredictable and oddly predictable so um yeah i think I, I, I like I don't understand why anyone be, would be attracted to mainstream politics and not the environmental movement. I mean, a couple of things you've just outlined there, are obviously, about the communication of these ideas and how that's that's shifted. And you mentioned earlier that that's that's quite a lot of the work that you're doing right now. You know, you mentioned this thing that you're doing with Ellie Golden. So what, what does that look like? What are you trying to to achieve there? If we take that example like this, you know, someone with a platform like that. And, and presumably a strong interest in this, like what, what is it you're trying to help her achieve? Um, well, I did sort of start out trying to help her to communicate, but I think very quickly she became someone who was trying to help me to communicate because she's very good at communicating, which is why she sells, you know, millions yeah, she's of, got of a, records. Got a good track record there, definitely. She does. And actually like songwriting, when she crystallizes these ideas about like really intense emotions, but it's able to tap into this, like, every man, kind of every woman, every human kind of sentiment to, to make it resonate. I mean, you know, that's such a powerful thing to be able to do. And I think, like many things, for me, this work around communicating nature and climate has been a bit of a corrective. 
So initially I got into this subject because I felt like no one was talking to me and my friends, you know, when I was much younger. And um, it was all a bit like sock and sandal and which is now quite trendy actually. But it wasn't then. And then, and, and very divorced from mainstream culture, which all seemed to be about consumerism and wags and private jets and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, where is the, it's polarised, where's the middle ground? As You know, we were talking about middle ground uh, possibly before we started recording, but we were yeah. talking about that. Pe- people that listen to this show will be very familiar with me banging on about the middle ground okay they know that's one of your things okay well so that was what i was trying to do is really find the middle ground and again i thought there were some really interesting concepts um i grew up partly in totnes in devon which is like deeply ecological if anybody knows it so there was a schumacher college there um which is all around ecological theory earth logic you know the planet comes first and then dartington school of arts was open at the time and it was all based on very, very sustainable uh, permaculture principles. And there's a permaculture community there and all, all the rest of it. I didn't identify that at, with that at all growing up because my dad, who is from Belfast, ran the local bacon factory and everyone else was vegan. <laughs> so it was like really super <laughs> awkward. And I felt very ostracized from that movement. I didn't like it. I was deeply suspicious of it. But I really liked some of the concepts And I really understood that we needed to protect the planet. So I suppose early on, I was like, where is my place in this? Um, You know, I didn't feel like I had any claim on nature. You know, I wasn't, I didn't own any of it, unlike other people that were around. I didn't own any land. I didn't, I wasn't from a really like hippie family, but I really wanted to do my part. So that's when I started trying to evolve this way of talking to people who were like me and my friends or whatever, and trying to mainstream some of these ideas. So I had a column in a national newspaper um, for many years, like 14 years. And then I realised that as the movement evolved, that talking about individual action and, you know, a lot of what you get asked as a sort of environmental agony aunt which is what I essentially became, is like, what can I, what, I want this, okay, so I want this pair of shoes, Um, I want them to look the same, I want them to cost the same, I want them to be as fashionable, but I want them to be really, like, planet-friendly, okay? And I was like, oh, it doesn't quite work like that. And then I wasn't able to condense stuff into these into these tiny windows of opportunities that I had to to communicate. And I began to get very frustrated and I felt like I was giving really bad advice all the time. The movement was changing and you had this whole kind of swathe of young people who were talking about structural change and I was still talking about individual change and it it just became like I didn't feel that I was contributing. So stopped all that, new start, and I thought this time I want to do this properly. I want to understand what the best communicators do. I want to use science and research about communication. And I want to um, really properly try and make a difference because we're running out of time and I felt like I was farting around a bit. And inevitably, I still spend a lot of my time trying to say in a nice way, oh, you know those pair of shoes? You can't have it the same, exactly the same because it's from a different system. And people are always asking me about what they should put in their bin. So I haven't moved very far, but I am trying. That's really interesting, though, because obviously, you know, there's a couple of things that strike me. You know, I'm probably guessing, but I'd, I'd, I'd guess that you almost create, you know, when you created that platform for yourself or when you developed that role for yourself, it didn't really exist, did it? It's not like that was a viable career path for you as somebody from Totnes to to be like, hey, you know what? I'm going to get a column in the Guardian, and, and well, then, you know, also, so my, my... yeah. But it was, it wasn't even like people thought I was really like damaging myself. Like they were like, what are you doing? And I, I, I actually lived in Totnes for a couple of years as a kid. Well, outside of Totnes, but I moved around a lot. So my family are from Liverpool and Ireland, and I live between Ireland and England. And I went to 15 schools, so I, I can't really say that I'm from anywhere, but I always always wanted to live in London <laughs> I was obsessed with it um, and and I just desperately wanted to do that 
but I wanted to live in London and I wanted to talk about the natural world. So two very opposing things, it would yeah. seem. So to create the platform for yourself that you did in the first part of your career that you described is obviously a really impressive thing. So to give that up, to give that up, as you've described, must have been a really huge decision because, you know, on the one hand, you've got this platform, pragmatically, you can make some difference with it, but you're saying that you felt like, well, actually I'd be better off finding different platforms and, to, and, and you know, with, with the message that I actually want to share, which is a, which is a really sort of brave thing to do. Oh, well, was before, that, was that... well, thank you. But before, before I sort of spin it in a way that makes me sound really courageous, I should point out that I was fired. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> but in a way it's good because, well, firstly, I think there's a very interesting debate that happens now. Like, um, I see it on social media all the time. So we're really having a massive conversation, especially in the UK. And I think in America as well. I don't know about other countries because I don't speak other languages, but about press and media and mainstream media, obviously. And I don't mean mainstream media in a way that, like, a, you know, a, a tinfoil hat wearing. Like, yeah, I love yeah, yeah. mainstream no, media. I, 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 I yeah, love it. But I, that... I, I, that's kind of what it's I called. Get you. That's kind of what in it's the called. Non, in the non-pandemic sense, I get Exactly, you. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, I love newspapers. You know, that's where I trained. Uh, I love making TV for, you know, very, very mainstream programmes. But you see debates now, and I really pick up on this, and that's like mainly younger writers sort of going, why does... It's so set in stone. And I understand it's like if you've got, um, if you're an editor and you're responsible for 20 pages or whatever, and then you have these formats within that, even in news pages and common pages, there are news, there are formats. So you can phone up or email or whatever a, a journalist and say, give me 200 words on this for this section. And everyone knows what they're doing. Well, that means that some of it becomes formulaic and repetitive. And sometimes you are writing to fit the space. And of course, you know, traditionally we're paid by the word. So the more drivel I turn out, the more I get paid. <laughs> like that's bonkers in many respects. And then you bring social media that sort of hit like a meteorite. And, you know, it's all about brevity and getting the message across. So we start to appreciate lots of different forms of communication. And then suddenly you have people asking questions like, why is this person a columnist? Like, what gives them the right to tell me what to do? And couldn't that space be used in a more interesting way? And I think that's really valid. And I think, you know, being a columnist for 14 years, is quite a long time, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I've always thought those jobs, any job like that should have a shelf life, personally. Totally. However, when it is your job and it's your identity, it's quite hard to lose, yeah. lose well, it. I still think I'm still going to go with the, the courageous angle, even though you've just oh, fessed up that you got sacked. I did get sacked. <laughs> I did get sacked. However, however, I did speak to, there's a wonderful, I don't know if you've come across her, there's a wonderful um, psychotherapist called Caroline Hickman who has worked a lot with Extinction Rebellion. And I did, um, I'd interviewed her a couple of times and I, I was sort of in the midst of like understanding what, what I wanted to do next and why I was feeling like I didn't want to do like pitch articles that I used to pitch. I did actually give up another column in a, in a women's magazine because I just felt like I was sort of lying and they always wanted me to make everything really happy and pretend that you could buy something and it would solve a load of problems. And I just said, look, it's a bit awkward. I'm not really feeling that right now. And I spoke to her about it and she said, you, you know what's happening is you're becoming brave and you're facing up. And she said, well, and she said she has done that in her own life. I hope I'm not misrepresenting her. You should get her on because she's a wonderful speaker. But, you know, when she works with young people and, you know, we talk about eco-anxiety a lot, they're not just, it's, it's full on crippling anxiety. You know, it's like, they are so, so desperately worried about the future of this planet. And 
she said the only thing that you can do is stand alongside them and it doesn't mean that you'll get everything you write or everything you say is going to be negative it means that you have to take what's happening really seriously and I think that is courage in and of itself so to stop doing all the stuff that you were doing before which was kind of turning a blind eye to this that and the other and just saying yeah I hear you I'm taking it seriously and I'm standing with you to some extent so that's been a shift for me yeah so like I say the sacking slash quitting notwithstanding you know ultimately my point that I was getting at was you know you lost your platform which is so what what did you what came next like how did you decide to cope with that like what was the next the next plan was that doing collaborations with different people like like you've been describing um it was probably because i had some of those collaborations i've been doing already because they're very long-standing friendships really um i what did i do i just became more of um more happy to be behind the scenes i think and work on really interesting things which were maybe a little bit deeper in the supply chains and deeper in different um, organisations and, you know, I'm more interested in um, levers for policy change, um, how political systems change, things like, I was really interested in the Climate Assembly and I remain really interested in those kind of formats um and just i suppose embarking on quite deep deeper education there's always reading to be done in this subject isn't there i mean you can, yeah. <laughs> you're never stuck for something to do and then really i mean luckily enough i've continued to oh plastics happened didn't it so you know our planet sort of happened around the same time and i was just inundated because um, I do TV as well, so I was sort of inundated with TV stuff, um, which, you know, tick that box, because at the end of the day, I'm a performer, so it sort of ticked that box and um, also gave me the opportunity to try it out. So here was an issue that's very tangible, literally, because everyone has plastic in their hands every few seconds, and people felt so strongly about it because of our planet and this kind of awakening had happened, and then my sort of question was, can we have this conversation and can we connect it to climate? And then can we take this energy into climate and into the climate, uh, into climate action? Okay. So I had, a, I had a ready-made like thing that happened straight away um, and was kind of all consuming. One of the things you mentioned earlier was when you were working as a columnist, you know, this, basically this people saying to you, like, I want, I want, I want to change, but I want it to be easy, essentially, you know, which is, um, no, it's my, I want to change, but I don't want to change. Yeah, exactly. So like that, which is something I've become increasingly interested in the more I've, the more I've been doing this, like the, how you actually get people to change the behavior in a way that has substance and and meaning and and also like significance to in a, in a way that will will actually shift things in, in the right direction um got any views on that yeah <laughs> no i just no small, i'm joking but I, <laughs> just a small question but you know what i mean like i'm just because again like looking at the you know you've got such a great perspective on this because of how long you've been thinking about this because of the different positions that you've held, because of the different insights that you've gleaned from this work. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I am really interested in that because it's easy to do things on a sub, you know, like a surface level, isn't it? To sort of carry the coffee cup, um, do, you know, recycle your plastic and, and, and those things. And, but to actually make changes of significance is, is a different thing. Um, have you, have you noticed that that has been a, something that's a real challenge for the movement? Well, what I'm lucky, the way, where I'm lucky is because I have had a very peripatetic life in many respects. So as I said, I went to 15 schools. I grew up in lots of different areas, parts of the country between England and Ireland. Um, and then I spent, 
from 2007, I was working for this show on BBC One called The One Show, who I still do some work for. So I was literally every week, I'd be going to three or four different counties and making VTs. And I was just out talking to people all the time of all walks of life. And so what I think I understand is um, what makes people tick. And I speak to as many detractors. Um, so when in the run up to um, the referendum in 2016, I was f- constantly on fishing boats for some reason. <laughs> and all... it, was quite, it was quite an emblem of the, of the referendum, if yeah. I remember correctly, for both sides. Totally, totally. And I get quite seasick. So I've been sick on every, <laughs> every small uh, fishing fleet has, has a, had to watch me puking into over the side. Anyway, but I, um, so was, I was constantly exposed to people who held a different view point from my own and I think that was really really interesting and what I sort of began to really kind of be interested in are um, barriers to changing your thoughts uh, defense mechanisms but also how we on if, if I'm thinking about the climate movement or the green movement make such assumptions you know it's like we are very quick to judge before we even like start a conversation with someone and you know the points of commonality i mean this is not like particularly a revelation people's kids their grandkids um you know that's obviously a trigger point um what they're going to hand on to their kids and their grandkids um there are some people who just don't care and you know probably they will never change um, but there are people who are, and it doesn't mean they're stupid, and it really annoys me when people are categorised as stupid, but there are people, as we know, who are uh, more likely to um, take on board a conspiracy theory, whether it be about Brexit or what the EU is doing, whether they read it on the side of a bus or where they get their information from. And quite often I was sort of finding that people who, again, not a revelation, but even back in 2016, people who had a very limited exposure to the media, maybe they were getting all of their information from Facebook, plus a guy called Ron, who had the bar stool next to them in the pub, were developing a really sort of warped sense of what the environmental movement wanted to do and also uh, stuff like climate change. And it's about building trust and having trusted voices that people recognise and sometimes building a bridge as well to this commentary. Because I think if everyone that you hear or see looks the same and sounds the same on climate, then inevitably that's a risk because a lot of people won't identify with that sort of person. And it could be, I don't want to sort of single anyone out or be horrible about any particular demographic, but say it's someone who is from North London, uh, from quite a privileged background. Um, I mean, it is just hard for some people to identify with them. And it brings us back to the central point that the movement hasn't been wide enough. It just hasn't been wide enough and there just haven't been a lot of different voices. Um, And even I felt quite excluded at times. And I'm not particularly, you know, like I don't tick many diversity boxes, but I was considered really diverse in the early days. Really? Yes, exactly. You sound like, really? Yes. (laughs) A, I was was a girl and that was sort of unusual. But, you know, back in the day when I started writing, it was very much a, you know, um, elderly white male preserve and, and not to diminish their work, because people did some incredibly important work and set up the agenda. It's always been very posh and always based, especially in the UK, just because of the way that our system worked. Because a lot of our environmental history or legacy comes from conservation. And people who own the land were more likely to want to conserve it, you know, or they had the power to conserve it. So it has been quite a sort of landowning um, uh, sort of 
the metrics that defined who was in the environmental movement and who wasn't in the environmental movement were kind of based on things like that. I think in America it's really different. Uh, but again, people's, people have been excluded far too often. So if you think around the Great Lakes, for example, you know, you've got real working class communities who go fishing and hunting, like that's their thing. And, you know, they have often been, they see it as their role, their custodians of that landscape. Uh, and that will be something that's been inherited a lot of time. But because they hunt, uh, they're into shotguns, possibly into Trump, you know, they don't have the right sort of politics. They've often been excluded even from the conservation movement or the conservation conversation. Try saying that. Yeah. So we've excluded a lot of people, but we haven't been welcoming welcoming enough. But for me, in the last 12 months, that's something that's really started to change. And I feel um, very happy about that. Yeah, I mean, that's been a, definitely a theme, hasn't it? So you feel that... Um, well, the other issue with that, I should say quickly, is that you you just end up focusing on a narrow range of issues don't you really that that basically suit or the, the the preoccupations of that particular demographic as well and and perhaps don't don't consider the the wider implications of some of these things and the actual real life effects that that, that they're having on you know real people around the world yeah and it's always really difficult because you know especially and this has been one of the justifiable uh concerns around individual action and what you might call green or ethical consumerism is that, you know, when it comes to energy and having a different boiler and having panels and, you know, access to renewable energy to buy in at a certain point and be progressive, you need money, you need to own your own home, you know, and it's, it's we haven't been, been a little bit lazy about um, all of that sort of stuff. I think in the early days, you know, I remember Project in Brighton, I just heard the seagulls behind you, and mm -hmm. um, there was, you know, a local authority project where um, I can't even remember where the housing was, maybe near the station, but there was um, a renewable energy um, retrofitting project and stuff like that. So at various times there's been money around and when the money's been there, you know, some progressive local authorities have pushed, have pushed that towards addressing this disparity. Um, but it hasn't been consistent enough and it's always the first thing to go. Those kind of projects are always the first thing to go. We just haven't invested enough in bringing everyone on this journey. But you do feel like it's changing. You do feel like there's, a, there's, I there's feel some like, progress being made. I feel like not, not in that way, not in an infrastructure way, but I feel because housing, housing is just a shambles all over the place. Um, but the wider, the, the wider, the wider, the wider conversation, kind of focus. yeah, on yeah. communication, because there's so much energy, especially in the wake of Black Lives Matter. And there's been such a wake up call, particularly for the environmental movement, um, that I think that that is really beginning to change. I've, I've just come across a lot of projects recently where I thought, wow, that's actually um, really changing the status quo in terms of whose story this is and who is telling it. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about was, um, you know, you've done a lot of work around fast fashion, like a lot of um, a lot of work in trying to raise awareness of the actual reality of of that um, system. You know, there was uh, I've I've been seeing you justifiably getting pretty exercised about. Um, I think it was a BBC show, wasn't it, recently that kind of. Or, or a show that was on TV that was kind of like a new look at like the world of fast fashion and, you know. Oh, misguided, like, made in Manchester. That was Channel 4, four part. Channel 4, yeah, uh, sh sure. Supposedly a documentary. We'll um, see about so, and And it's, it's one of those, you know, areas that is hidden in plain sight in a lot of ways because it's something that everybody completely benefits from. Benefits, again, inverting the commas, takes for granted at the consumer end i mean and, and has absolutely no consideration about like the you know the environmental impact the social impact so could you kind of explain a little bit about the work you've been doing to raise awareness on that topic yeah sure um so in 2011 i published or a, um, my book was published by harper collins for the state um called to die for which was basically um talking about exactly the supply chain of 
uh, the fashion industry. It's not just fast fashion, because we also talk about luxury fashion. And fashion back in 2011 was not as fast as it is now. I'd say it was like hyper rapid uh, online. The brands like Boohoo, Misguided, Pretty Little Things, you know, that's a, a, a whole new paradigm for fast fashion, which is speeded up even more. And um, it was, it was, so it was, there was a lot of warnings in To Die For, really. And the subtitle is, is fashion wearing out the world? And, you know, spoiler, the answer is yes. So um, in that, we talked about uh, water use, pesticide use, but also the ethics of the offshore garment industry, where uh, women, young women, because really by the time you're sort of early 30s, you are struggling to find jobs in garment factories. Um, but young women, it's a mass mobilization being brought in from rural areas to centers of production um, like Dhaka in, in Bangladesh. And, um, you know, living these lives that were really sort of unacknowledged. Uh, it was dressed up a lot as opportunity, so global development. And uh, really, I just started examining whether or not that was the case. And then To Die For was essentially taken um, by Andrew Morgan, who's a film director based in LA, had no previous experience of the fashion industry, but he has four children, even though he's barely a child himself. And he was reading the New York Times uh, on April the 24th, 2013, the day after the collapse of the Rana Plaza factory in Bangladesh. And he saw two boys searching for their mother in the rubble. And he, the boys were the same age as two of his kids, exactly the same age. And he asked himself a really simple question. He said, how is this happening? And how did I not know about it? And then he made the true cost, which I'm in and I'm a producer of. Um, and that really took those issues to uh, a wide audience. It was like a, it was Netflix's best performing documentary of 2015, apparently. And the point about that is that we were interested in global development. And if you talk about it in terms of fashion, then other people became interested. If we made a film and said the global development of the garment industry, like literally no one would ever have clicked on it. Um, so that's what I have been um, like profoundly interested in for all of this time. And within that, there's lots of different arguments and it really comes down to a couple of things for me at this point. One of the reasons why I got so annoyed with the with the series that you mentioned, Misguided, made in Manchester, Channel 4 brought out in August, the four-parter, was that it was a completely uncritical, unbalanced sort of love story and promotion, like an extended promo for what I consider to be a business model that is profoundly damaging. And I would go further and say that it's a system of, overproduction for overconsumption with a huge environmental and social impact at every single stage along the way and there's 101 different steps from raw fiber to finished garment so there's a lot of opportunity for both intervention to make things better but there's also a lot of opportunity for disaster and rana plaza of 2013 is the biggest industrial accident in inverted commas that humanity has ever created or ever known. And really, if it had been any other industry, I feel like we would have had more of an examination. We would have stopped the clock, brought in aid and support, a bit like has happened in Western countries with uh, the global pandemic. And we wouldn't have pressed go until we had ironed out those problems. But fast fashion doesn't work like that. It's completely relentless. Um, and so people always ask me, could Rana Plaza happen again? And the answer is yes. So I know that 12 people died in an Indian cotton works this morning in a fire. This happens every single day. Thankfully, not on the well, scale was, of Rana Plaza, but yes. Yeah, I mean, even in, in the UK, you know, there was 
coronavirus outbreaks in in those supply factories weren't there like concentrated outbreaks which are basically down to poor working conditions in in these factories aren't they you know so it's not like it doesn't affect us in the uk either like in in a very in a very real way yeah i think an ind independent review um has found that boohoo the brand in that um instance or that certainly kicked off those allegations uh wasn't knowingly operating illegally i think that's what their barrister said that they commissioned um but uh, that there were failings in the system. So that was in Leicester. So that's um, a very well-known hub of the UK garment industry. And to be honest, we had a big inquiry into the fashion industry, the fast fashion industry in, I think, 2018. The Environmental Audit Committee took evidence. I gave evidence. Lots of people gave evidence. And there was a lot of evidence given about working conditions in Leicester saying that people were being employed illegally, um, they were being underpaid, there was huge wage theft, all the rest of it. And it was it was kind of pretty much ignored. Right. Until coronavirus happened. Yeah. Um, so these things are absolutely known about within the fashion industry. They're realities of production. And they're realities of production because we want things at incredibly low prices. So how can that change? <laughs> Well, I have lately... Just another, just another little question. Another for little you. question. <laughs> We're dealing with all the tiny questions today. I, would, um, I, I'm, I am in favour of the abolition of the fast fashion production system because I think, you know, I mentioned there's 101 points for intervention in theory. Ultimately, what happens is there's a lot of focus and sort of hullabaloo and energy and all of these schemes and stuff that go into like a couple of the points like hey let's make it circular hey let's you know do this do that and it's all concentrated on a ton like a ton of clothing so let's decarbonize this ton and while everyone's focusing on this work this good work that's going on there's another 20 30 tons like going out the door and it's just the relentless nature it's a volume issue as well and from a waste point of view, you know, lots of people have talked about fashion waste being the next big um, plastic story, like the next big problem. And it's it's like the amounts are just mind boggling. And it's got so big and so out of control that it's really hard to think of interventions without big policy interventions, which are going to correct it. Like you can try and get people to keep clothes a little bit longer and stuff like that. But because of the volume and the global nature of it, it's not going to be successful. Is it, but is there an appetite for that kind of legislative change? I mean, that sounds like a, a huge, huge task. Not in the UK, I don't think, because I think that um, fast fashion producers are too are two, um, the linchpins of this kind of super fast economy that's trained on making investor value. And they're too important to the stock market and all the rest of it. And it's that it's too tied into the current administration and all the rest of it. But I do think that there are some interesting things that I've seen in France, for example, um, without getting into the deep of it around trade law and descriptions and if you can tie, so I have done some work with a project um, for uh, an NGO called The Circle, which I'm an ambassador for, which was set up by Annie Lennox to look at global development and women, essentially. And they have a lawyer's circle um, led by Jessica Simon, uh, QC, who's fantastic. Like, she's so brainy. And I don't want to misdescribe what they do, but essentially they look for opportunities, um, especially within trade law, to link supply chain ethics to um, the license to operate, if you like. And once you start linking, because quite often it's a bit like... It's a bit like in biology or whatever, you know, like scientists use gene markers in their research. With sustainability, because there's no appetite to like change the whole system and say, hey guys, stop making loads of money 
and do this because it's really important because it's all about short-term survival you have to somehow embed or link the sustainability so that it can't be separated and that's what you know um if you get legal brains on this that's the sort of thing that they will do um so the living wage report that was produced by the circle basically looks at 100 year old um human rights law and shows that living wage actually paying people a living wage is enshrined in that law so it makes a really kind of like sturdy legal case and then there's subsequent work where they're trying to make sure that that's embedded into trade law basically you give these people an opportunity to find a remedy and they will look everywhere and they will find a way of doing it so that's the way to go we've got to be really smart about it and and go away from the sector like fashion people stop talking to fashion people about sustainability because you don't know and you don't have the answers you need to work with other um it needs to be multidisciplinary otherwise we're not going to get progress so earlier you you know you said oh, i'm an optimist so i've got a pretty obvious question you know yeah. like you've been you've been at this a while yeah and even it, is it challenging to maintain optimism in the face of no this shift? No, I don't think it is actually because maybe in like fast fashion, I'm not very optimistic about fast fashion, as you may have gathered. Um, I don't believe that brands are going to suddenly find a magic formula for doing what they do, but within the parameters of the of planetary boundaries. But I do find that there's a lot of shift taking place which is based on evidence and common sense. And, you know, a lot of people really dig that, like they really, they get that completely. And I just like the way that a lot of this has become so mainstream and so easy to access. And I think we can make it even easier and I think we can embed it even more. And that gives me great grounds for optimism. But optimism is different, isn't it, to reality. I was saying this the other day because we were talking on social media about um, uh, people used to get sent out at school for talking or told off for talking in class, me obviously, and loads of people were saying, yeah, I used to get told off. And then they were talking about how you expected to be silent at lunchtime as a really small child. And we had a dinner lady called Mrs. Cheesley, which is actually was her name. That is the best dinner lady name ever totally (laughs) totally but she was so invested it's in silence at lunchtime for seven-year-olds wow she was really quite harsh like you're always getting sent to stand in the corner or whatever for speaking and then i thought well in a way that's optimism because every day she came in and every day she thought this is the day when these kids are going to be quiet they're finally going to do it they're finally going to do it this is cheesy seven-year-olds <laughs> um, and sometimes I feel like that, like I just keep bouncing back and keep coming back and going, yeah, we're going to do it this time. And I think there's an element of that within all of us who've been involved in this movement for a long time. But I think there are signs, aren't there? And also, what yeah. else are you going to do? No, but there are signs, you're right. And, you know, as you mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, there there are big signs that you know that you can you can really get behind yeah but you know obvious question but had had to ask it and on the subject of obvious questions um this is one i ask most guests on here because a lot of people that listen to this show are very engaged very um passionate about the issue and also pretty keen to to do something so um question i often ask guests is if you you know if somebody listening that's wondering how to start or make a difference like what advice would you give to them well i like communication as you know and i would ask them if they're passionate about this and maybe quite knowledgeable um is there a way that they could reach out to someone who they don't normally talk to and have a conversation about it without being like a bore or (laughs) a stalker or whatever but is there some someone that they could think about a creative way to communicate this issue to and whether it be it doesn't have to be you don't have to go in straight with climate politics but maybe you know someone in your family 
who's got a bit of expertise, who's retired from like a particular industry or something, um, and maybe you could find some sort of common ground. Um, but I really think like actively reaching out and expressing your values and having a conversation, um, but a two-way conversation with people, I think is like one of the most important things that you can do right now. And then it's not a surprise and it's not like weird because I think ultimately at the end of the day, all sustainability is and sustainable change and sustainable development is really like, it's, it is change and it's preparing people for change. And if you don't prepare people for change, you don't talk about it, you don't mention it, it comes as a shock and people can get really defensive about it. Um, and sometimes, you know, I've had um, over the last few months, I had a text message from someone in my husband's family who um, I thought was a right Tory, to be you know, honest. And I didn't never thought, I thought they were like a real free market capitalist sort of person. <laughs> and then they sent me a thing and they were like, just want you to know that I saw this story. And it was about something that was happening in the garment industry. Um, and I was absolutely appalled. What can we do about this? And I'm like, wow, there's an opportunity because that person might be a member of, you know, local conservative association or something that I'm not involved, you know, I don't have an in with. And we can, you know, then we start that conversation going. Um, some people are really interested in the mechanics of different industries and how things are changing. And some people are more interested in the story and want like inspiration and, you know, to be uplifted. I've also found that with lockdown and everything, um, a few people in, in my neighborhood um, have formed are just very community spirit minded and they have got like um whatsapp groups neighborhood whatsapp groups for lockdown and then there was some appetite within those to move into sort of like green issues and conservation issues um so we we're all on the river here so we're absolutely paranoid about flooding <laughs> so you know that's a reality for people who live around here so they they talk about things like everyone on this street has changed to a renewable energy supplier, for example. And that came quite organically out of this um, neighbourhood WhatsApp group. So what will be interesting is to see how lots of those community resources, if we can change those and make them pertinent to climate crisis and stuff like that but it's all about engagement at the end of the day sorry that was a really long-winded answer i'm glad you're a listener no it's a good <laughs> it's a good it's a good it's a, it's a good answer i mean i felt really seen earlier when you said we're so judgmental because i really realized you know what you were essentially saying was like let's have a nuanced conversation about this and i was a bit like wow that's pretty unfashionable these days you know that's well, never I'm catch well i am very unfashionable but, <laughs> but you know i really felt that because because I, re I realized like, yeah, I am, I, I am definitely quite judgmental in, in, instinctively about these things when I do have those conversations. And I kind of didn't really realize the extent of it until I think everybody's like that, aren't they? It's, you know, it sounded like what you were saying was like, you know, try and try and park that a little bit, understand it a bit more. And, and you know. Yeah, I mean, there's some people that are challenging. Of course, but most people, I think that, you, that you're going to be having the type of conversation that you, you've just advocated you know, like this, like the person that phoned you about the issue that you thought was the, you know. I know, the, that was the, a surprise. But there's, you know, there's a you, program on Radio 4 called, the, I think it's called The Red Line. And they get two people, sometimes I can't listen to it because I hate one of the people so much. And they get two <laughs> commentators who've got really opposing views. And they bring in a woman from the Conflict Resolution um, Organisation, Society, whatever it's called, and she's highly skilled at negotiating and she gets them to ask each other questions and to listen and stuff like that. And it's really like great. It's taught me a lot because that those are the kind of things that were sort of missing from my education and my upbringing. Because we just used to like I was, you know, in my life, it's always been the person with the loudest voice that gets heard. So, you know, I developed a loud voice, but then I found that I was missing quite a lot of fear. <laughs> the other things that you need to have a nuanced uh, and productive life so I sort of like to try and pick up those bits of education um 
I, I went to Kenya a few years ago to, to the um, UN Environment Assembly in Nairobi. And on the flight, I was sitting next to a um, conflict resolution negotiator who basically talked to me the whole flight and explained what he did and all the rest of it. And I was just like, oh my God, this is the way forward. We should all train to few, do this. Did you run a few scenarios by him? <laughs> yeah, probably. You know, it's quite a lot what, of what do you reckon though, to so probably. Yeah. I'm going to try it. I'm going to, um, cause, cause I think, yeah, it's, it, it's, it can be lacking in this debate, can't it? It's so, it can be so polarized and so, well, so I binary, understand why. You know. Yeah. And another thing that I really want to say actually is that because we're all feeling it's so urgent and it is urgent and we've had a lot of inaction and false starts that that can affect the nature of our communications. So if you end up, finding that you're speaking super fast or that you're making like really frantic content or you're just putting like cramming loads of ideas in there it's because you are feeling that urgency and what we need to do is decouple it from our communications because it's off-putting to people it's alienating and it's too much so you have to make sure that it's paced in a way, and it's not dumbing down or anything like that. It's just pace it in a way that is not going to um, push people into different territory into the, in the wrong way. So there you go. That was my conversation with Lucy Siegel. If you want to find out more about what Lucy does, then I'd say her podcast, So Hot Right Now, would be the place to start. You can also find Lucy over at The Siegel on Instagram and watch the film the true cost on most major streaming platforms. While you're over at Instagram, you can follow me as well. I'm at We Look Sideways. Thanks for listening to this episode and for the support for Type 2 generally. I release new episodes of Type 2 every month or so through my usual Looking Sideways channel, which you can also subscribe to via Spotify, Apple Podcasts and all the usual podcast platforms. You can also find the entire Type 2 back catalogue and the entire archive of my main Looking Sideways podcast over at my website, www.wearelookingsideways.com. Coming up to 150 interviews with some of the biggest names in action sports and other related endeavours on there. Pretty sure you're going to find a few that interest you. So go and have a look. All right. Nice one. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.